Today we are going to discuss Peter Corso, an interesting character in New York City criminal history. He's a man not often discussed, and a man profiled in Robert Daly's 1978 book, Prince of the City, and John Roberts in Evan Wright's 2011 book, American Desperado, where he was identified as the father of John Roberts' longtime partner, Phyllis Latore Corso. Peter Corso was the uncle to prolific Jamaica crew hitman Henry Borelli, who was also discussed in the book American Desperado. Furthermore, Corso's exploits were covered by numerous news outlets during his criminal career in the 20th century. Corso was born in the early 1920s in New York City. His criminal record dated back to the 1930s, and he was involved in crimes including drug trafficking, armed robbery, and murder. In 1953, he would get slammed with a 15 to 25 year sentence for his involvement in a burglary and armed robbery ring, said to be responsible for as many as 25 jobs. The ring would be broken up on October 23, 1952, when Peter Corso and three associates were nabbed after robbing a Woolworths on East 13th Street in Manhattan. During the robbery, they had beaten two employees and hogtied them. Arrested with Corso were 30-year-old Fred Habler, 40-year-old Saul Shapiro, and 38-year-old Sidney Ruddish, a man who was once sentenced to the electric chair for his role in the stick-up murder of Coney Island patrolman Leon Fox in 1941. However, after winning a retrial, he would have his case dismissed in 1946. He obviously didn't learn his lesson. Corso would appeal his sentence in 1962, stating that he was offered leniency for his cooperation, but still received a lengthy sentence. However, the courts disagreed with that notion and rejected his appeal. He would go on to serve 15 years. Upon release, he would get involved in heroin trafficking and make connections in organized crime. It would be due to his involvement in heroin trafficking that he would be arrested in 1971 and given a five-year sentence for intent to distribute three kilos of heroin. In the 1978 Robert Daly book, Prince of the City, Peter Corso's involvement in heroin trafficking, which led up to his 1971 arrest, would be profiled. The book covers the exploits of Detective Robert Lucy, who was chosen by federal prosecutors to investigate corruption in the NYPD as well as criminal enterprises operating on the streets of New York City. This corruption later detailed in the Knapp Commission. Detective Robert Lucy would work in the Special Investigations Unit of the Narcotics Division in the NYPD, under the codename Sonny. He would record numerous conversations he had with corrupt cops and underworld criminals. He would start tailing Corso in early 1971, when his name was supplied to him by an inmate working as a confidential informant. The inmate would state that Corso was moving a lot of weight on the streets of New York City. He was also reported to be avoiding parole hearings at that time and was wanted by the parole board. The parole board supplied detectives with a picture of Corso and a known address. Corso was found to be living with his family in a Brooklyn brownstone under the pseudonym Peter Carbone. He would be wiretapped and found to be associating with a man by the name of Jacques Bless, also known as Jack Bless a man identified by law enforcement as a major dealer, with connections to Harlem gangsters such as Ray, Spanish Raymond Marquez, the prolific Harlem numbers runner, notably affiliated with Fat Tony Salerno. Detective Lucy was on the cusp of nabbing Corso, but his plans would be thwarted by NYPD Detective Joseph Nunziato, who unbeknownst to Lucy was already tailing Corso himself. Nunziato would arrest Corso with three kilos of heroin, which is where Corso would receive his five-year sentence. Upon release, he would go back to his old ways. Saturday, June 16, 1979. 49-year-old Archimedes Cervera, a powerful Long Island attorney with ties to ISLA Long Island's Republican Association, is found shot dead in his office at 330 Motor Parkway in Hopog, Long Island. Archimedes had a storied career. He grew up on Manhattan's west side and served in the United States Army. He would go on to graduate with a law degree from the Ivy League University of Pennsylvania in 1957 and make his home on Long Island, New York, where he established himself as a prominent member of Long Island's Hispanic community, being the first Spanish-speaking attorney in the community of Brentwood. In the 1960s, he would get into politics on Long Island, and during his time practicing law, he helped close numerous multi-million dollar land deals on Long Island. On the day of his death, he would arrive to his office in the morning and meet two of his scheduled three appointments. By the evening, his wife Nellie Cervera could not get in touch with him, prompting police to knock down his office door, where he was found slumped over his desk, 
shot dead. In the days following his death, stories of Archimedes Severa falling on hard times would fill the press. It was said that Severa owed as much as $500,000 to mob-connected bookmakers, lost thousands of dollars in investments, and had a history of trouble with the IRS. A close associate of Severa's would claim that in recent months, he was in fear of his life. Early on in the investigation of Severa's murder, notorious Lucchese mobster Salvatore Avellino would be a prime suspect in the murder. Police would discover that Avellino made a call to Severa a few hours before his murder on June 16, 1979. Ultimately, police would rule out Avellino, and the case would go cold. Tuesday, April 4th, 1984. It's closing in on five years since the death of prominent Long Island lawyer Archimedes Severa, and police have finally made an arrest. 62-year-old Peter Corso, of 15 Arpage Drive on Shirley, Long Island, is apprehended. Corso was coming off a two-year sentence after being arrested once more for heroin charges in 1981. At the time of this arrest, he was also in possession of 2.2 grams of cocaine. He would be charged with drug possession and what authorities called the contract killing of Archimedes Cervera. Law enforcement would tell the press that Corso was a prime suspect early on after admitting to meeting Cervera the day of his death. But much like Salvatore Avellino, they didn't have enough to connect him at that time. However, recently they received new information which enabled them to make the arrest. That information being provided by one Michael Orlando, a career criminal, mob associate, and FBI informant. Michael Orlando recently testified in court, helping to expose U.S. Secretary of Labor Raymond Donovan and his mafia connections in the Bronx. Years prior, he had furnished the FBI with intel concerning the pending assassination of Carmine Galante in 1979. He was a knockaround guy with a long criminal history, and a man who gathered intelligence for the feds, all the while continuing his criminal lifestyle. He would tell authorities that Corso was paid by a disgruntled drug dealer to off Archimedes Severa due to some money owed to him by Severa. At the time of Corso's arrest, authorities would not reveal Orlando as an informant in the case, but would say something rather interesting. According to them, Corso's arrest tied into a recent indictment against 21 members and associates of the Gambino crime family. That indictment included stolen cars, murder, prostitution, loan sharking, narcotics, and a bevy of other offenses. This indictment referencing none other than, you guessed it, the Roy DeMeo crew. They would state that the 32 caliber revolver was provided to Corso by someone indicted in that case. Now they didn't mention who that was, but let's look at a couple of possible options. Of course there was Henry Borelli. After all, he was the nephew of Peter Corso and could have easily got him a revolver. Another option could be Edward Fast Eddie Rendini, another one of the 21 indicted and a man responsible for supplying the DeMeo crew with numerous guns and silencers for their murderous operation. Certainly something to think about. It's clear that Corso had access to the crew. And in 2023, the YouTube channel Dominic Montiglio, The Life, would produce a clip featuring former FBI agent Art Ruffles speaking about Corso and his nephew Henry Borelli. Now, he doesn't mention Corso by name. However, the clip is rather interesting. Let's check it out. Uh, we got a call. Kenny McCabe and I, Detective McCabe and myself, uh, got a call from a guy out in Long Island had been arrested. He was Henry Borelli's uncle. And he was, in the, he was involved in the French Connection. Yeah, the smack case. Right. And uh, I'm trying to think of his name now. I can't remember. I know. <clears throat> I, I actually do know, but I, I can't think of the name, but this guy was his uncle. He was a big narcotics dealer. And uh, he called and asked us to come out. He was at the uh, Suffolk House, Suffolk County House of Detention on charge of murder. And he called us and asked us to, uh, if we'd come out and talk to him. Well, we knew, we knew who he was. Right. And we said, sure. And so Kenny and I went out and uh, went to the prison, and we spent four hours out there, one whole morning with him. And uh, he told us that you know, we told him about Henry Borelli. We we had 
arrested Henry Varelli and we're the guys who put him away. He says, well, he says, you know, I knew when Henry was with the, with the Mayo group, he says, Roy the Mayo used to ask Henry for me to come down and visit. And he says, I would never go there because I didn't trust those guys. He said, they were vicious. I said, well, is it safe to say that you operated between the five families with narcotics? He says, yeah. He says, I had uh, immunity from the five families. When it came to narcotics, I'm the guy, or one of the guys that they could deal with freely. So he said, I knew all the five families. He says, the Mayo crew was the worst one that I knew of. And uh, that was that was coming from pretty high source. This right. guy was really big. Yeah, he was a tough guy. But anyways, oh, the other thing he said, well, he was a killer. <clears throat> he said, he says, one of the other reasons I didn't go there is I always told Henry on the side, I always, he said, I always felt I was going to go and have to kill Roy DeMeo for Henry someday. So I didn't want to get friendly with him. Now, aside from that interesting tidbit from FBI agent Ruffles, Peter Corso's name also appears as a confidential witness on a law enforcement list which details homicides proven to be perpetrated by the DeMeo crew and those believed to be. Here you see possible victims unidentified male around 1976 or 1977. Motive, reportedly stole drugs from Canarsie Stash House owned by DeMeo. Participants, Edward Danny Grillo and Roy DeMeo, possibly others. Note, after victim's disappearance, confidential witness Peter Corso informed of the circumstances by Danny Grillo. Now, despite how much Corso was weary of the DeMeo crew, I think there's at least some evidence that he dealt with them especially since his nephew Henry was a top shooter and one of the main enforcers within the crew. During Corso's 1985 trial for the murder of Archimedes Severa, Michael Orlando's identity would finally be revealed as the informant who told of Corso's involvement. Peter Corso would also be out of this being in Severa's appointment book under the pseudonym Pedro Coro, a name prosecutors claim Corso used in the past. It would also come out that the FBI hid Michael Orlando's name as a potential informant from the Suffolk County Long Island investigators at the time of Severa's murder, due to his current testimony in other cases. Furthermore, Orlando's distasteful criminal career would also come to light. He would be outed as a man who committed numerous criminal acts, including hundreds of burglaries and murder, all the while maintaining a relationship with federal authorities. The trial would also show that Suffolk County police investigating Severa's murder would not record by audio or in writing any conversations they had with Corso during their interviews with him. Perhaps the most bizarre thing to come out during the trial was that the answering machine audio from Severa's office was accidentally auctioned off in a police auction, meaning that any information on it could not be used in court due to it leaving police hands, regardless if the police now had control of that audio. Pretty weird stuff. This information coupled with the testimony from the incredibly unappealing criminal informant Michael Orlando, would leave a sour taste in the jury's mouth. And on Tuesday, July 2, 1985, 63-year-old Peter Corso would be acquitted of murder and also escape charges of cocaine possession. A true failure in law enforcement investigation had occurred, and Peter Corso was reaping all the benefits. After the fallout from the trial, Suffolk County police would be probed and numerous hearings would occur which would investigate their recent history of failed police work. Saturday, August 22, 1987. 65-year-old Peter Corso is back in police custody. He's arrested with 27 others as part of a cocaine ring operating out of Suffolk County, Long Island. Authorities said the ring was receiving numerous kilos of cocaine from Miami and bringing in close to $1.5 million in revenue monthly. Corso would be named as one of the leaders of the ring but the kingpin was 35-year-old Carlos Alberto Herrera, a Colombian man who was doing time in Attica prison for cocaine distribution. Unbelievably, he was able to mastermind the scheme from behind prison walls, using facility telephones in order to coordinate shipments between Miami and Long Island, New York. Corso originally met Herrera while they were imprisoned in Suffolk County Jail back in 1984. Peter Corso hadn't learned his lesson. 
He went back to the only life he knew. The only way he sought fit to make a buck. Sadly, Corsa would drag his family into the cocaine ring, and they would also find themselves part of the indictment, looking at serious time. They were his ex-wife, Carmela Cervone, his son, Anthony Celentano, and his brother, Joseph Corso. In January of 1988, 66-year-old Peter Corso would take a plea deal in exchange for leniency for his family that were caught up in the indictment. They would be given probation. Prosecutors would have Corso's 1984 cocaine possession charge reinstated, and he would be given a one and a half to three year sentence for that. In regard to his latest exploits, running a cocaine ring out of Long Island, he would receive a 12 years to life sentence. However, taking a plea and admitting to his role in the ring was not all the prosecutors wanted from him. They were going to let Corso's family walk, but they wanted something else. They wanted him to finally come clean about the details in regard to the murder of Archimedes Severa on June 16, 1979. And in March of 1988, that's exactly what they got. Corso would admit to his role in the murder of Severa, which finally enabled Suffolk County authorities to close the case. However, Corso would claim that the Suffolk County police only made his admittance a part of the plea deal because they wanted to embarrass Suffolk County Judge Stuart Nam, who presided over Corso's trial in 1985, where he was acquitted originally. Corso felt that Suffolk County police didn't want to take accountability for their sloppy police work. According to Corso, the murder was contracted out to him by an old buddy, a man featured alongside him in Robert Daly's 1978 book, Prince of the City, and a man he spent time with in prison in the early 1960s. That man was none other than Raymond, Spanish Raymond Marquez. Corso would state that he met with Marquez on 76th Street and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan, and that Marquez offered him $15,000 to get the job done. Corso said that Raymond Marquez wanted Severa dead because he felt that he supplied him with lackluster criminal defense, which led to him being sent back to jail. Furthermore, Spanish Raymond Marquez failed at recuperating money given to Archimedes Severa for said defense. Corso would say that on the day of Severa's murder, he walked into his office at 330 Mortar Parkway and produced a gun. Severa would state, What are you doing? Corso replied, If you don't know by now, you'll never know. He would proceed to shoot him multiple times. Authorities didn't have enough to pursue charges against Marquez, and Corso refused to further cooperate. Raymond Marquez's son and attorney David Marquez would state, There is an unequivocal denial of anything this man says, and we are not aware of this man's testimony before any law enforcement agency. He would further state that it was simply Peter Corso assassinating his father's character, and that law enforcement should get to the bottom of who was really behind the assassination of Archimedes Severa. Law enforcement didn't take David Marquez's statement seriously. The most important thing was at least getting Corso to admit to the murder and enabling them to close the case. But that wouldn't be the only murder Corso admitted to. According to Peter Corso, he also murdered a man by the name of Irving Miller in 1977 and murdered a black male in Greenpoint, Brooklyn around that same time. Authorities viewed the info as very sketchy and passed it off to Brooklyn authorities. I myself could not find any further information on these homicides, and I feel that it's likely they were never pursued by authorities. The 1980s were winding down, as was Peter Corso's criminal career, a career that went back to the 1930s. He was a man that spent decades of his life behind bars and weaved his way through the criminal underworld, committing robberies, dealing heroin, and murdering people. At 66 years old, and reportedly suffering from heart disease, Peter Corso was going back to the can for what seemed to be the remainder of his life. I hope you all enjoyed this upload. I tried to dig into Peter Corso's final days on Earth, but unfortunately, I could not find anything. It's likely he died in prison, or was let out on the cusp of death. He would be over 100 years old today. And as far as his nephew Henry Borelli goes, well, as many of you know, he still sits in prison today, where he's been for over 35 years. And most likely where he will spend his final days. Thank you for listening to New York City Crime Spot.